let me give you a little bit of information on Senator Kirsten Sinema. She is a Democrat. She won the U.S. Senate election in 2018 over Republican Martha McSally. She was the first Democrat from Arizona to win a Senate seat in 30 years. Do I have that right? That's right. 30 years. Uh, quite an accomplishment in a red state like this. Closely contested election, uh, Senator Sinema won. Senator McSally, we'll get into this a little later, was appointed to fill the John McCain seat. Uh, she now has to run again in 2020, and if she wins in 2020, she'll have to run again in 2022. So three elections, four years. Uh, pretty rough, uh, rough ride ahead. Senator Sinema sits on the Banking Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Homeland Security Committee, and as she just reminded me, uh, is on the Regulatory Affairs subcommittee. Uh, I think we're going to talk about that uh, today. Uh, before that, she was a state, uh, she was a member of Congress for three terms from Phoenix. And before that, she served in our state legislature. She has five degrees. And we're not going to talk about that. All set? Exactly. <laughs> no more. I'm, I'm off to Greece for a while. Okay. I'm glad to be here, but Bram, you got a strong sock game today. Strong sock yeah, game. Yeah, it's. Did you guys see this? It's good. <laughs> strong sock game. We will not be talking about your fashion today, though. Also strong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's start with news of the week. Uh, your office says you're meeting with AG William Barr next week. What questions do you have for him? Um, I have a number of questions for Attorney General Barr. Um, some of those of you who aren't from Arizona may not know this, but um, as a new member of the United States Senate, I decided to take. Uh, a, a somewhat different approach than my colleagues to um, addressing the issue of nominations. We all know the Senate's job is to provide advice and consent to the president for um, his nominees to the judiciary and to cabinet level appointments. And um, in recent years, this has devolved into a largely partisan experience where people choose to vote yes or no on a nominee based on their personal political opinions and whether or not they mesh or agree with the nominee. I believe that that is um, not the role of a senator. The role of a senator is to provide advice and consent. So um, I decided that I would approach the role of uh, the senator providing advice and consent in the way that I think our forefathers intended us to do. So I asked three questions of all nominees before making a decision on how to vote for an individual. And the first question I ask is, is this person qualified to do the job? Do they have the appropriate ac academic background, um, experience, et cetera? Um, are, are they qualified? The second question I ask is whether or not this person believes in the mission of the organization to which he or she is being appointed. Um, so, for instance, if someone is being nominated to serve as the director of the EPA, does this person believe in the mission of the EPA? And if the answer is yes, then we can move forward. And if the answer is no, then I'm, I'm not going to be able to support that individual. The third question that I ask is whether or not this person um, has made a commitment to fully uphold the law, even if there is an instance, however likely or unlikely it might be, that they are asked by someone else to not uphold the law um, or to act in contravention of the law. So um, I actually laid out that kind of theory um, with Bram before I, I took my first major vote. Um, I spent some time interviewing Mr. Barr before his uh, nomination, and um, in our conversations, which were lengthy, um, he met those three qualifications, and I supported his nomination. Since then, there have been some troubling reports, uh, troubling for me, reports that Mr. Barr may have testified in a committee hearing in a way that was not accurate or truthful. And um, I have asked Mr. Barr for a meeting so that he and I can discuss these apparent discrepancies and so that I can find the truth of the matter um, to the best of my ability. So that, that's what we're going to meet about next week. It should be pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just for some background, Sen Senator Sinema, in running her campaign for the Senate as well as in the Congress, has staked out an independent position. She's a Democrat, but was one of just three Democrats to vote for to confirm uh, William Barr. You've objected to his use of executive privilege. Yes. Has his conduct as Attorney General lived up to what he told you in those interviews about the way he would conduct himself? There are some apparent discrepancies, and I look forward to discussing those in detail with Mr. Barr next week. You mentioned executive's um, use of executive privilege to keep, yes. keep from you the Mueller report you want to read unredacted. That is right. So um, 
one of the things that Mr. Brown and I discussed in our initial interview prior to his nomination vote was the forth, at some point, forthcoming Mueller report and um, our mutual desire to have it be as transparent and as open as possible with the fewest amount of redactions. I do think it was appropriate for the Attorney General's office to redact the report before releasing to the public. Obviously, it, it is a national security threat if you release an unredacted report of that nature entirely to the public because there is information that is very important to national security. However, members of the United States Senate and members of Congress should have access to that full report. And I was dismayed um, at the President's use of executive privilege. I feel like it was not appropriate. And I was further um, dismayed that Attorney General Barr recommended that move and supported it. Do I, you I'm sorry, do you regret your vote? I do not. Uh, based on the interview and the discussion that we had, um, I act truthfully in all of my interactions. I fully expect that everyone that I interact with does the same. And based on the information um, that we discussed during our lengthy interview prior to his nomination, I felt confident I was making the right decision. Based on the information that I had at the time, it was correct. Let's move to the Alabama abortion ban. There is a stampede by several states to get to the Supreme Court with their abortion bans in hopes of overturning Roe versus Wade. Should the U.S. Supreme Court leave the Roe versus Wade decision alone? Well, this is long settled law. Roe versus Wade is a, a, a landmark decision that um, frankly just declares that uh, healthcare decisions should be between a woman, her doctor, and her family, and that the government should refrain from interfering into the, that decision made by women. Since that time, as we all know, there has been significant encroachment on that decision in subsequent Supreme Court decisions and subsequent state laws around the country. Um, it, it's clear to me that the movement by Alabama and other state legislatures which are receiving much less political and media attention, that these are concerted efforts designed to challenge the basic tenets of Roe v. Wade in the Supreme Court. Now, I don't make predictions about what will happen in the future, because people who make predictions usually end up looking stupid, so I try to avoid that. But what we do know, based on kind of the history of litigation and, and how court cases um, move up in, in our country, some of these state laws will up, end up in front of the Supreme Court, and this appears to be a very strategic and concerted effort to continue to chip away at um, at, at Roe v. Wade and the fundamental rights and freedoms that are afforded to women and their families when they make these important decisions about their life and their future. You did not support the nomination of uh, Brett Kavanaugh. You weren't in the Senate at the time. That's right. Uh, how confident are you this Supreme Court will uphold Roe v. Wade this year, next year, the year after that? I don't have a good answer for you because uh, I don't know. The, I don't know. Let's move on to immigration. Uh, yesterday, the president presented an immigration plan. Uh, I'll uh, admit it's unclear to me. The different pieces in it still remain a little unclear. Based on what you know about that plan, does that offer a way forward for the United States to improve border security and deal with the migrants who are surging at our border? So I think a more productive approach is an approach that actually we as senators are working on right now. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham, who is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction, which means that's where any legislation to address immigration and the current migrant surge would be addressed in the Judiciary Committee. So Lindsey Graham is the chair of the committee. Um, I met with him yesterday. Senator Dick Durbin met with him yesterday. Um, and I am part of a small group of uh, members of my party who've been meeting one-on-one -on -one with Mick Mulvaney, who is the chief of staff to the White House. He's the president's chief of staff, and with acting, uh, the acting secretary of the DHS. We've been meeting on a weekly basis to talk through what are some possible fixes, some legislative, some administrative, to address the migrant surge that is occurring right now. Um, my, I have a number of questions about the president's proposal because we, have, we haven't seen all of it. Um, my largest concern is practicality. Um, those who know me know that I'm an, a very, very practical person. And it is highly unlikely that major changes to immigration laws are passed in this United States Congress. It is a deeply divisive time in Washington, D.C. And passing changes to hot button issues like the Flores decision, which is the decision that says that families cannot be detained for more than 21 days at a time. 
Making legislative changes to that are highly unlikely. And those are the types of proposals included in the President's plan. I've had a very productive conversation with Senator Graham and with members of the administration about workarounds to find more practical fixes to the migrant surge that both address the current situation and solve some of the structural problems that have caused the migrant surge. A lot of people aren't talking about this, but the reason you see large groups of migrants approaching our border from the Northern Triangle countries are because the cartels who operate in those countries have chosen to use this as a business model. So they are charging seven to $14,000 US per person, telling folks, bring your family. Once you get in, they'll process you and release you. Then you can disappear and live as an undocumented immigrant in the interior of the United States of America. That is the business model. So what we have to do as a government is to change that business model so it's no longer an effective one for the cartels. The challenge is, is that if you make legislative changes very large, like say changing Flores, or um, making big changes to uh, how we detain and deport unaccompanied minors, like teenage boys, who are a large part of the group that are coming. If you do that quickly, you tend to overcorrect, and then you've created other mistakes and problems. Um, if we can both look at administrative solutions to change how we're processing individuals and some legislative solutions, I think we'll find a more nuanced, more practical, and more appropriate solution. That's what we're working on right now. And I will say that Senator Graham is a, a reasonable person to work with. He is interested in finding a compromise. And based on our initial early conversations, I feel um, optimistic about this, uh, our ability to solve this aspect of immigration law. Let me be clear, that's just to deal with the migrant surge. There's a whole larger system of broken immigration system that still needs to be addressed. And that's a much larger and more difficult political animal to deal with. Uh, let's talk about your role in the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, as a member of that committee, you get to confirm members of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, what do you think of Jerome Powell's performance to date and how he is withstanding President Trump's jawboning to lower interest rates even more? So I've had a number of conversations with Mr. Powell and meetings with him. He's an intelligent individual who was qualified to do the job. Uh, my personal opinion is that the Federal Reserve is an entity that should be free from political interference and influence. And um, the fact that he continues to go to work every day and do his job, regardless of the chatter around him, I think is a, a real testament to his role as a professional. And I commend him for it. Uh, it is hard in the town that we work in um, to keep, keep your head straight when everything's swirling around you. But those who are willing to let go of the political partisanship and ignore the noise around and focus on the signal tend to find success. And I believe that's what Chairman Powell is doing. Let's talk about trade. Uh, China, a trade war with China. Uh, what do you tell Arizona consumers uh, about the pain they're going to endure if these tariffs are indeed imposed, uh, and as well as businesses? Uh, how long should they be willing to accept them yeah. for a deal with China? So um, I'm going to reject the premise of that question. Uh, isn't that nice? It's so good to have a microphone. Um, Can we cut that off, please? Uh, <laughs> I actually don't even need one. <laughs> um, it, he, it's true. Uh, in addition to serving in elected office, I saw, I've also been a, um, a lecturer at ASU for um, 17 years. So I don't even need a mic. Um, I, I don't think that consumers should have to deal with this, and I don't think consumer, consumers should be at, or told or expected to deal with this because this trade war is manufactured and it's inappropriate. Um, it is true that China is a bad actor, particularly in the IP space. They are bad actors in stealing our patents, et cetera. But the way to get China to behave differently is not through a manufactured trade war that actually hurts Arizona businesses, right? So American businesses are those who are suffering, and we as Americans are actually paying a tax on all the, the, the goods that are impacted by these tariffs. So here in Arizona, we have a strong manufacturing base, and the tariffs that have already been implemented have had a negative, measurable negative effect on our small businesses. In our state, 99% of all businesses are small businesses. They're filling in their pocketbooks already. They're paying more for the goods that they use to create their um, products, and they're losing business in exporting worldwide. We're also feeling the hit in our agricultural and our dairy community, where we are earning less on the dollar for the exports. 
um, that we are sending out. So um, rather than just complain about it, I think it's, it's better to take action. So I introduced legislation with Senator Rob Portman, who is a Republican from Ohio. Um, our legislation says if the executive chooses to enact unilateral tariffs, which generally, generally speaking, the White House can only do that if they are doing it for a national security imperative. Otherwise, it has to go through Congress. So the president has used this national security exception to institute these tariffs. What our legislation says is, okay, the Department of Defense needs to certify that there is a national security imperative for you to impose these tariffs. Because as of right now, we have heard no national security argument, we have seen no data, we have received no argument that supports that these tariffs are being implemented for national security. In fact, the President's own language um, very strongly suggests that he is doing this to get tough with China, but not to protect our national security interests. Um, so that our legislation doesn't take that power away from the executive. It just says you have to prove it. Um, and we think that is a reasonable, pragmatic way forward to ensure that that power rests with the executive when appropriate, but is not abused or used inappropriately. Now, earlier today, you probably didn't notice this because you guys have been in this conference all day, but earlier today, the president did roll back the tariffs on steel and aluminum towards Canada. And that's an important step forward because we can't really move forward on the USMCA, which is the like reimagined NAFTA, kind of. Um, we can't move forward on USMCA until that had been taken care of. So that's a good step forward. It's hopeful, but it doesn't solve the problem that we have with China or the coming tariffs that will continue to hurt Arizona businesses. Um, so this is our response. We don't think you should have to deal with it. We think they shouldn't be there. All right. Uh, I'm going to give our audience a chance to ask some questions. Do we have a mic, uh, Brian? Is there a mic? Uh, there we go. Okay, Bernie's got a mic. Uh, please stand up, identify yourself, and the news organization you're with. Hi, my name is David Hood. I'm a reporter for S and P Global Market Intelligence. Senator, uh, this is a bit of a curveball. So, um, uh, so a bill. So were his first two questions. <laughs> L l let me see what I can do here. Um, so a, a bill to delay Cecil, uh, the current expected credit loss standard, is mm -hmm. expected to be introduced. I thought it was going to be today or in the next few days. Uh, do you plan to co-sponsor it in the same way that you signed on to a letter to the FDIC and the, uh, and the Fed uh, a week ago? So last week, Senators um, Jones and Tillis and I did a letter yes. about Cecil. and. Yes. Um, I can't give you a definitive answer about the legislation because I haven't personally reviewed it, okay. and you should never commit to sign on to something that you haven't read, right? That's that's like legislating 101 sure. or 201 for some people, but um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Usually after you've made the mistake once, you don't make it again. Um, but I am looking forward to seeing this legislation. I am, I, I do sh share these concerns as you saw in the letter that I signed about Cecil, and we do want to make sure that um, there's a second look and that we're thoughtful before we move forward. Gotcha. Uh, the second follow-up is uh, why why the FDIC why uh, why the Fed if FASB doesn't have uh, oversight like why those two agencies if FASB is its own entity. Well, I think that the purpose of our letter was really to raise awareness um, amongst the entire federal system and amongst our colleagues in the United States Senate about this coming issue, and so a letter is usually the precursor to taking further action. Gotcha. Thank you, Thanks Senator. Thanks so much. Okay. Hello, Senator. Uh, Andrew Ramonis with uh, Bloomberg Law. Uh, last year, the Jobs uh, Act 3.0 capital formation package made it through uh, the House, strong bipartisan support, mm -hmm. stalled in the Senate. In this Congress, uh, what do you see as far as capital formation legislation goes um, that can get through the Senate Banking Committee, get through the House Financial Services Committee, get through the House Senate, and ultimately become law? Well, I, again, I don't make predictions because you end up being wrong a lot of the time and then you look silly. Um, but I do think that there is there's a continued appetite. Um, as you know, when I was in the House, I was a strong supporter of moving forward with this legislation. The House dynamics have changed. There's a new chairperson. The party control has changed in the House. And the dynamic between the House and Senate leadership is um, challenging right now. Uh, in the Senate, um, recently, Leader McConnell has um, focused almost exclusively on moving nominations forward. 
Several weeks ago, you may know that he and members of his party changed the rules to reduce the amount of debate time for nominations from 30 hours to two hours. And so now we vote on a lot of nominations very quickly, which is not a good way to run government. Um, yeah. So, but since that, since that rule change, we have considered um, no legislation. All the, literally, the only thing we've considered was a, a potential um, veto override of the president's Syria veto. And so we haven't been moving legislation past committee since that time. Um, whether or not Mr. McConnell will change his mind and allow the Senate to move legislation is yet to be seen, but I hope that we do. Um, if s such time does occur that Mr. McConnell would like to move substantive legislation, I do think that we have a good bipartisan coalition in the banking committee. Uh, Mr. Crapo is a delight to work with, and um, there's just a lot of bipartisan um, energy in that committee, and I think that we can move forward. James Medora, I write about the economy for Newsday. I'd like to ask you to expand a little bit on your comments about the USMCA and whether you think it's an improvement over NAFTA and what the chances are that this would be uh, ratified before we have the election. Um, again, the second part of your question is a prediction, which I, I don't have an answer for. Um, I do think that the USMCA, in many respects, is an improvement over NAFTA. Um, what's important to me is, as I evaluate proposed trade agreements is to look at what this means for Arizona businesses. What does this mean for us in terms of our export and import? Uh, as an aside, that's also another one of my big priorities this year on the Banking Committee, is to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. Senator Rounds and I are working on legislation to do just that before the expiration that comes this year, September 30th. It's a big priority for Arizona. In the last five years, over $2 billion of funding um, has helped support Arizona businesses. So it's a big deal for us to help level the playing field with countries like China, which are fully subsidized. Back on track. Um, a trade agreement like USMCA um, has, al from what we see so far, has elements that are good for Arizona businesses, which is, of course, the lens through which I approach it. My concern um, is a macro concern, that it it's can be difficult to move forward on, on trade agreements um, when the executive is waging manufactured trade wars in other parts of the world. Um, and those do have an impact on your ability to enact and adhere to trade agreements such as the USMCA. And we have a non-cohesive trade strategy in the country right now. It, it, it's confusing at best. To, when you're launching tariffs, which actually hurt your own companies and businesses, and then also saying you want to move forward with bilateral, trilateral, and other trade agreements, you're sending a really confusing set of messages to partners, potential partners around the world. And I think there's some concern and hesitancy by our allies in, around the globe about this unsettled approach. Yeah, there's a question one more there. Thing. Senator, I'm Kevin McKenna. I'm Deputy Business Editor at the New York Times. Um, we're Welcome heading to Arizona. Thank you. Um, we're, we're heading into an election cycle in which we're at record low unemployment, uh, job growth had, has continued to be strong as well as economic growth. Ch it's always a challenging um, equation for the party out of power to make an argument for uh, an economic argument for why there should be a change. Um, we're also, it's already, already become clear that uh, the Republicans will portray your party as the party of socialism. What would be um, your uh, prescription for your party as to how to make a, an economic case in 2020 uh, for them to choose uh, the Democrats? You know, what's interesting is you're actually the first person who's ever asked me that. Um, the Democratic Party has not asked me that question. So thank you for asking. Um, as Bram mentioned at the outset, I um, am a registered member of the Democratic Party. I am a, I am a very independent person and have always been. Um, and I believe that the strongest way um, to make a case and an argument to voters to choose you is to, number one, be authentically who you are and not try to be someone different than who you are because I think voters can see through that. Um, anecdotally, that is something that Donald Trump is very good at. He is who he is and he doesn't ever apologize for it. And that is something that, like him or dislike him, is true about him, which 
is part of what is appealing to him for many people. Number two, I think that um, a strong campaign is a campaign that focuses on the concerns of the voters whom you are trying to earn the trust of. And when you are campaigning about issues that matter to very small segments of the population, um, you might be doing that for a strategy to win a primary where you have to divide up between, what is it now, 23,000 candidates or something along that nature. Um, but to win a general election, your, your job, I think, is to listen to what the will of the voters is. What is it they're worried about? What are they concerned about? And what is it that you have the power and ability to do to assuage or answer those concerns? What can you do to help make that person's life better? And if you can answer those questions, you're in good shape. But if you're spending your time focused on kind of splinter issues that don't matter to everyday people, I think that you will have a difficult time winning your election. And again, I'm, I'm only speaking from my own personal experience. Uh, I am not running for president, <laughs> to be clear. Yes? Uh, no. <laughs> Overqualified. Um, <laughs> so, so I can't speak with any kind of authority or expertise about the national level. What I can tell you is my own experience running campaigns in Arizona from state representative all the way up to the United States Senate. And what has always served me well is to stay laser focused on the things that matter to the people that I seek to serve. And if you do that, people will make a decision based on how they feel about you. And my opinion is that when I was running, that voters chose me, as Bram mentioned, first time they've elected a Democrat in 30 years in Arizona, first woman ever in the history of the state. Um, I think it's because people trusted me and they believe that I'm authentic and genuine. And those are the things that I would say a candidate would need to be. It, it's more about characteristics than it is about a policy book full of ideas. And I'm getting the universal rap sign. Oh yes, uh, I'm late. The, you're late, you're always yeah. late. It's, uh, it's so true. Take, this gentleman's been waiting. Just one more question, that'd be okay. Thanks. Although I hope I, it's a yes, no I, question. I did never say I was a gentleman, let the record reflect. Uh, the, uh, I've spent the week at the uh, Mexico border. You're a border state senator. I'm curious if you could uh, share a little about what you're telling Senator Graham and Mick Mulvaney uh, beyond a migrant surge. Th these are people coming from what most people would agree are failed states. At least four of the five Central American nations probably qualify as a failed state. So what can you do to keep people at home? What are you, what, yes. give us some ideas of what the kind of things you're talking about. Um, well, uh, what I'm really focused on and, and where I think my um, expertise as an attorney, as an Arizona, and as a child of the border. Uh, I was born and raised in the border area, so this is my life. Um, my expertise is about what changes do we need to make right now to send a message to the cartels that this is not an effective business strategy. That's where I'm really focusing. Many of my colleagues, um, who have much more experience in the United States Senate than I do, um, and have been doing work on a kind of a multinational level for a much longer time, are focused more intently on how do we help rebuild and repair those states, similar to the relationship that we've had with Mexico in the last 20 years to help them become a more able partner in taking care of their own people and helping stop the flow of illegal migration. Um, and, and that would be an area where Dick Durbin and, Sen and Senator Feinstein are really taking more of a lead. Um, I'm really focused on the legal aspect of what things can we do legally to address this surge and get the cartels to stop bringing people here. Because while it is true that th those are s countries are failed countries, there are other countries that are struggling that are not seeing massive surges because they don't have the cartel mechanism to get those people here. So it's a two-pronged solution. Stop the cartel's mechanism. In, if you make their business model not financially feasible, they will stop doing it, right? Oh no, it's getting all the people on a plane and sending them back to the home country. You do that a couple times and they will f start looking for another way. The third thing the government needs to do, and this is something from what I understand the government has not done in the past, which is hire some smart people to start thinking like the cartels. Like we should be anticipating what their next move is. They're always gonna look for the next easiest spot to smuggle people in because smuggling is what they do. 
And what we need to do is to think, what is the next thing that they're going to look for? Right. And, and I'm really late. You are. Senator Sinema, thank you so much. Thank you.